What's up, everybody? How y'all doing out there? Thanks for tuning in to the Crash Bang Boom podcast. Today's guest is drummer Dan Ryan of Groove Rock Quartet Crowbot, who talks his roots in Madison, Wisconsin. Wisconsin? I'm not quite sure how to say that. What's left of my southern drawl just won't quite allow me to properly enunciate that. But Dan talks about the three days he had to prepare for his first shows with the band, the cover bands that he played in early on, early drum sets, driving his parents and siblings crazy, Austin margaritas. You know, I love that frozen avocado margarita down there. Plus the reverence European crowds have for American bands and a whole lot more. Crowbot's new record, Mother Brain, is officially out, so be on the lookout for that, as well as them out on tour for the rest of this year. I hear they're going to be out there with the one and only Steel Panther, so you can get a few laughs, get your rocks off, have yourself a good old time. Speaking of new records, shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking to press a record, go on over to NewOrleansRecordPress.com to check out the vinyl coloring, packaging, mastering, and more options, and you can add it all up in the real-time quote generator and the website there. Need assistance with design or packaging? They can help you, and they print both 12 and 7 inch records in both 150 and 180 gram variants, and they print small runs of 100 and larger runs up into the thousands. And that's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. Give them boys a holler. Crash Bang Boom can be found on iTunes Podcast, my SoundCloud and YouTube page, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, Player FM, and a whole lot more wherever you want to get it, exception of Spotify. So just go basically everywhere else other than Spotify to find this thing. And if you like what you hear, feel free to check out any of the previous nearly 150 episodes and give me a like, a subscription, a positive rating, and or a glowing review, and or all of the above and or aforementioned. The support is appreciated. So here we go without further ado. Dan Ryan, Crowbot, Mother Brain, get up on it. Crash Bang Boom! Sounds go mad with joy. All right, Dan Ryan of Crowbot. What's happening, dude? How the fuck are you making out there, buddy? No, just wonderful. <laughs> it's a heat wave here, man. Good yeah, got a little God. humidity in the air, huh? Yeah, just a little bit. Just We've a little just bit. been sitting in the van sweating and yeah. just trying to hurry up and wait. Yeah, and that's the way it goes. That's That was our alarm clock to wake up, and then that was our alarm clock to wake up to go to sound check, and it was just yep. nonstop. Yep. So there's not enough water or coffee in the world right now. Oh, <laughs> shit, man. Well, congrats on the new record, Mother Brain, out yeah. officially tomorrow. Today is Thursday. The 22nd is today, I believe, so mm-hmm. tomorrow's Friday the 23rd. Yeah. Uh, congrats on that. Thank we'll you. talk about that. Uh, one thing I did want to say is uh, the, for the first time I met you was at the very bar that y'all are playing tonight in St. Vitus. And uh, I had showed up there to potentially interview uh, the uh, uh, previous drummer of Crowbot, not realizing that that Crowbot now had a new drummer. I met you Mm -hmm. and you were like, man, I just joined this band like a week ago. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what was happening around that time and how you got that the the call to end up ultimately being joining Crowbot in the first place. Uh, so that was 2017. So that was you know two years ago. God, yeah, was that two years over. ago? That was two years ago. Yeah, because right. I think this is y'all's third or fourth time coming back to New York since then. At least third. Third, yeah, okay, third, third time. Yep. Okay. Um, and what had happened was I was actually putting together like a, a cover band. I was trying to make some money on the side. Yeah. Um, and keep my chops kind of fresh. Uh huh. Is this is that you're in Austin at this? I'm point? in Austin at this okay. point. And um, I was going to put up an ad for a keyboard player. Uh-huh. I had had everyone else, and um, we were just getting everything just going off the ground. And I went on Craigslist, and I saw International Touring Band Seeks Drummer, International Touring Band Seeks Bassist. And I, my first thought was, sure, yeah, okay. Right. Well, and I sat there for a minute, and I'll, I'll click on it and see what happens. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, I know this band. Oh. I look up the website, and I go, is this real? And I, I keep digging. I'm like, this is fucking real. Okay, yeah. I got to get a resume together. Yeah. So I just pulled all these old YouTube videos and things of myself um, from like 2007. Really? You know, when I was 18, I was like, here's the drum solo I did. Here's stuff with the old rock band. I, I couldn't put any of my current stuff because it was all like cover band shit. Right. But that <laughs> helped shape me, you know, get me gig ready and, and tour sure. ready and, and how to play to a click and tracks and all that stuff. So I knew I had that, but I didn't have the, the rock thing that was current. So I just sent uh-huh. them all this stuff, was as, as professional as I could be. And they immediately, like five minutes after I sent this thing, were like, hey, uh, we're going to go see Rocky Erickson down 
uh, at a bar that's five minutes from your place. You want to come meet up? I was like, yeah, I do. And uh, we talked for maybe 45 minutes. I uh, took off. And the personality test at that point, I passed. Okay. A couple months went by, and they ended up um, picking up a drummer from a friend of a friend. Uh-huh. Uh, actually, it was uh, Randy, the singer for Fate's Got a Driver. It was okay. a recommendation off him. And he's a solid drummer. This, yeah. he's Honestly, he was way better than I. He was <laughs> way more qualified. I, I had no problem with them saying, we're going to go with this guy, yeah. not you. I was, I was green. I mm-hmm. didn't have any rock experience that I could pull from yeah. recently. Um, but the thing is, is he showed up to get ready for the tour that I met you at mm-hmm. like three, four days before getting ready to go. And he didn't know any of the songs. Uh Uh-oh. And Crowbot is not a set it and forget it kind of band. Yeah. There are the riffs, they're they're tight, they're funky, there's a rage against the machine bounciness, Mm -hmm. but aggressiveness to it. For sure. And then they'll they'll do a bar of five for no reason, and then go right back in. So it's like, if you don't know what's going on, this is going to train wreck real fast, and it did. Wow. And I'm at work, and Bishop starts blowing up my phone, the The guitar player. yeah. Yeah, he starts blowing up my phone calls me i can't take it i ignore it i'm like hey i'm at work and he just unloads and he's like when can you get here Uh oh you get and he's like it's 45 minutes away it was at the machine shop um and i just was like yeah sure of course i can come over and in my mind i'm panicking i'm like this is so cool i think i'm going on tour right now if i can pass this test if you will and, you know, he asked me, he's like, do you know the songs? I was like, yeah, totally. I didn't know the fucking songs. Really? <laughs> yeah, no, the, this 45-minute job, I just played and played and played everything that I yeah. could just to try to slam it in my brain. That's the way you get and that. I was like, okay, just fake your way through it. Mm-hmm. Just get from point A to point B. It doesn't have to be fancy or anything, but if these guys can at least do the riffs and everything, mm-hmm. you're going to be fine. Yeah. And I got there. Literally had to like push this dude's drum set out of the way because he wouldn't leave. <laughs> no, it was no. he was sitting in a loft upstairs while all of this shit was going on. Oh Jesus! It was really awkward. I I barely even like recognized what was going on. I was so nervous. Like everything in front of me was just like a yeah. blur. I was oh. like, don't mess this up because this is. I was. 28 at the time yeah and i was get, i was honestly i was getting ready to be like all right turn it into a weekend thing mm-hmm. you know i was like if i hit 30 i'm out i can't do the professional <laughs> thing and so i was right. like i think this might be your only shot at this so mm-hmm. i was taking it really seriously i looked this dude in the eyes i have no idea what he looks like i was so nervous yeah but i just got in and i played it and i just remembered the bass player james at the time looked at bishop and he nodded and i went i'm going on tour yeah. I'm not going to ask anyone. I'm going on tour, you know. Wow. And my luckily my boss was cool with it. My girlfriend, she's also a musician. She understood. She was super excited for me. Yeah. And then I had 3 days to learn the entire Crowbot set. Really? And so days. then it, yeah, then it was like 8 hours a day by myself just trying to slam these things in, then rehearsing with them for like 4 hours. Wow. I was wearing a Fitbit. I was running like 10 miles a day just based on <laughs> hitting really? drums. Really? Yeah. So Wow. I was exhausted. I was tired. And I remember I had played at like a rehearsal volume at the time. You know, I want to hear what they're doing. I want them to hear what I'm doing so Mm -hmm. we can lock in. And then that first show, I just remember looking down at the set list going, all right, as long as you can start these songs in your head, if you can start the riff, Mm -hmm. you're going to be fine. I looked down at the set list and went, oh my God. How the hell does this one go? Oh, yeah. Bad, oh, dude. no. <laughs> you know, and luckily they were nice enough to help me out and they'd play a little riff or something if mm-hmm. I needed to. But that first cymbal hit, I think I cracked a cymbal. I was like, you got to get all of this nervous energy out on oh, one boy. hit just right now. Boom. And yeah. immediately everyone turned around and was like, hell yeah, where'd this come from? And I was like, okay, here we go. Off yeah. it's, it's off to the races at this point. And then it was just reinforcement over and over every single show. And then you met me. And that was a week, a week and a half into it. Wow. I sort of knew the songs at that point. Yeah. You know? And it was just more about just be a wild man, put on a show. The fills don't have to be like spot on Mm -hmm. just make sure that you start and stop the songs when they need to be started and stopped and yeah it's just been building ever since then that essentially in a nutshell that's the relatively long-winded version of Mm -hmm. how this thing got started it was a craigslist ad that is wild yeah craigslist you never know out of the blue too i wasn't even looking for it it just i happened to log in if i would have logged in five minutes later i would not be in this band that is wild man crazy turn of events. I always say Craigslist, you never know. I mean, I've gone on or auditions and whatnot and played with some of the most absurd musicians and like, you know, I don't know that you can still get sex on Craigslist anymore, but I mean, you can get, a, I know you can get some half, half working table, maybe a keyboard, 
you know, maybe, uh, I don't know what else, uh, there's all, it's like a, kind of like a wasteland, but every now and then you find a gym and then you hear a crazy story like this where it's like, yeah. man, there was a Craigslist ad and I ended, yeah. Strangely enough, all of the bands that I end up like working in that was in a touring country band before this, I found oh, them really? on Craigslist. So I, that was, that was the predominant, you were doing country music with the cover stuff? That, that was before the cover stuff. Okay. So I was in like a high school heavy metal band where yeah. I was actually writing a lot of the riffs mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that uh, and then teaching them and then playing them, you know, new metal stuff. It was like two th early 2000s and right. stuff like that. Um, and then I went and found this country band because they were working, like literally skipped my college graduation to go on tour in Nebraska wow. immediately to go play. And I played with them for like three years. Uh, and then I got into the cover scene because I mean the money's good and the players were good. And were you it playing was like immediate. downtown Austin and stuff? Like um, that? the whole southeast, all the way to really? Florida, Key West, down oh. Texas, uh, Louisiana a lot. You yeah. know, casinos and stuff like that. I had yeah. a stupid mohawk that I spiked up and all this <laughs> shit. But it was it was consistent. Yeah. And it was exactly what I'm encountering now, so it, it got me ready for it. And That's the thing, yeah. It got my chops up. It was a lot of different stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, if they needed a country shuffle, I could do it. If they wanted a Texas shuffle, I could do it. If they wanted, you know, just a pop groove or hip hop right. or heavy metal. I mean, like, I, I could do it. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And all of that has paid off in spades, especially writing this new album. I just sure. I just pulled from the bag of tricks. And it, and I could tell that Corey, the producer, was like, all right, cool. I'm going to push you now. And was, yeah. <laughs> which is beautiful and infuriating at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, the cover band thing can be a little tricky, I think, at times. I think it, once you get into that world, you can become so immersed in it that you don't so much pursue things creatively, or maybe that wasn't an interest to begin with. But I think that's a lot of people that only play original music shit on playing in cover bands for that reason, because they think that it's just kind of like the sellout move or something. And it's like, you know, you're learning f from masters who wrote masterful songs mm -hmm. and, and emulating that you are, you are learning and it does become part of your vocabulary. So it's yep. all a learning process. So I've never th seen it as a negative. Uh, and in fact, uh, you could do both. You know, I don't, I don't think you have to. Have, they're mutually exclusive. Like, why couldn't you do both? Yeah, you, you did both. Yeah. Well, all of Crowbot did both. We all come from the cover band thing. You know, uh, Eddie, okay. Eddie, the bass player. Yeah. He did a lot of reggae, pop punk stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, the singer and, and, and Chris, guitar, they played anything they wanted to play from country you know to leonard skinner to pop punk to they didn't care yeah. there was no format but because of that we all got good you right know, and, and tight and it it really showed when we sat down uh, especially this lineup right now it's like all right mm -hmm. let's run the songs it was just like everyone did their homework they, we right. did not need to talk about what the parts were all we needed to do was make sure everything was tight and it was because we all had that practice routine from exactly. cover bands so exactly. yeah it's easy to get stuck in that money for yes. sure it's easy to get stuck in that world it's it's easy yeah. uh, it, you, there's really not a whole lot of work yeah. did you learn the song or not cool show up on time that's it don't get yeah. drunk i think <laughs> it's not all three requirements it's a low bar <laughs> yeah. to hop over yeah but it really made us all better musicians and and it shows so it yeah it it, I can see why it would get, you know, kind of shit on, yeah. if you will. But if you have something on the side, which most of those musicians do, yeah. they have their little creative outlet, right. then who cares? Yeah, uh, yeah. 100%. So. Now, Crowbot originally from Pennsylvania. Yep. So when did they move to Austin, I guess? So Bishop moved there and then moved out. He was there for maybe a year. Okay. I, I really think it was less than that. Um, and then he moved back. Uh, I, I believe he wanted to be closer to family and things okay. like that. You know, that's halfway across the country is a really, yeah. it's a long ways. So I just, again, it was just one of those weird things. He just happened to be in Texas at the time. Brandon happened to come down and they were writing. And huh. then, yeah. And we're going to play two of those songs tonight. Nice. And that were those audition songs that eventually made the record and stuff oh, like cool. that. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, God, that, again, that was 2017. Yeah, it was 2017. When wow. I, yeah. Damn, dude. It sounds like everything starts clicking. You get the, the lineup that y'all presently have right mm -hmm. now. Uh, what have y'all been doing since then? Obviously, y'all recorded Mother Brain. It sounds like y'all you went to Europe recently. Yep. Uh, tell me a little bit about your experience and going over there, because I always like to hear how uh, musicians are so appreciated over there, specifically when, when you're an American musician, and mm -hmm. that people will go to a show not even necessarily knowing what you do, but in good faith or just the interest that you could provide something being this American band. It is so interesting, and so it's like a mind-blowing experience to, 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 to see that. 
It really is, and it's, it's crazy. They, it's it's like, it's a romance or something. They, they, yeah. they look at American bands and they go, "Ooh!" And there's just like there's this mystique about it, and mm-hmm. people do they show up. Right. And by the time you walk on stage, you can tell. And it's like this is electric right now. Yeah. There's, there's there's an energy going on, and you finish that first song, and it's louder than anything you've ever heard over here. So wow, it was it was a really cool experience for that. Where did y'all go? Uh, we were in the UK, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany. I'm sure there's others. It was a blur. Yeah. You know, How long were you all over there for? Like three weeks, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, three weeks. But it, but it was like nine days in a row and then yeah. a day off and then yep. get right back to it. Nice. Festivals were huge. You know, people just throwing down all day, drinking. But from the get-go, out of the gate, they're there to watch a rock show. Yeah. And then they stick it out for the whole thing and they don't have all the restrictions on fire and pyro and all this <laughs> shit i think they brought out uh it was uh Vakken. they had you know they've got those two huge stages mm-hmm. and they brought out like two tanks we couldn't stick around we had to go but they had a tank on both sides of the stage and really the stage was a stage st- flanked by tanks yes it was the most metal thing i've ever seen <laughs> and there was fire just going off fucking constantly whoa it was awesome that yeah, is bad so check out the videos that's where i saw it and i was like I, we we left we missed this oh wow so that's just a kind of you know it's they go big they go big over there yeah. especially for rock bands and since this is a drum podcast the scariest shit that they did was clap on beat i was like oh no uh oh really <laughs> oh they know what they're doing over really here. Yeah. they're not just losing it within a bar or so no no really they were had it yeah and they kept me in check I really like, oh, shit i just you got up. Your, i know it's crowd up. metronome shit yeah, exactly but i love that you know that yeah. meant that people were listening i mean people knew what to listen for music over there is way more ingrained in their culture yeah you know I think it's a little less over here. People are always trying to find the new thing, or it's, maybe it's even moved on to EDM or right. you know, whatever. There is definitely still a lust for loud rock and roll in Europe. Oh, yeah. And it's not underground. That's no. the thing. It's not underground. Exactly. So, so it's cool to go over there and just play that loud rock and roll, you know, and just turn it up to 10. And they loved it. It's like the louder I played, the louder they cheered. So yeah. That was a lot of fun. Was that your first time going to Europe, period? For me, yeah. For okay, me, for, so for your me first trip to Europe and you're over there playing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the stars aligned yeah. once again. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, <it laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Wow, that's a hell of a perspective on your first trip. You know what? Actually, now that I think about it, it was the same for me. In 07 when I went, I hadn't been to Europe either. So I was like, oh, shit, all right, I'm going to Europe. and playing shows. It was, it was, it was amazing. And mm-hmm. like I said, the, the whole respect that everyone gives you there and just the overall interest. And as you said, like rock isn't so much of an underground thing. It's just such a big cultural phenomenon. And they love it. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's an amazing experience. I, 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 it, I've always said that it's one of the more redeeming experiences that I've had in nearly 30 years of playing music mm-hmm. was going over there. And feeling so appreciated you know it kind of makes makes up for all the shit shows that you played throughout you know like i said 30 years of doing this right yeah all those <laughs> ashtray gigs yeah. yeah it's like all right this is finally paying off yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely man did you record mother brain prior to that uh last trip the europe trip or after yeah, yeah we, so we had been out of the studio we went in in god what was it it was february of 2019 okay so and we knocked it out <laughs> in a month and then it just takes time you got to set things up and then it was like all right let's start touring let's get this going now so that was our second tour since uh recording the album and we've been trying out new songs constantly right and to be honest they're some of the best received songs so we're gonna gonna play a ton of them tonight nice probably by the end of next tour we'll just play the whole album there you go (laughs) nice album in its entirety why not? Yeah, you know? fucking do they're, they're, it, They're man. good songs. We like them, and they're fresh. They're new. They're, you know, kind of a, a different direction a little bit for mm-hmm. Crowbot. Still very much Crowbot, but instead of it being the more, like, you know, Led Zeppelin-y, mm-hmm. it's more Soundgarden. Right. We just, Maybe it's a little more modern, less classic rock necessarily, even though, of course, it, it's funny that you mentioned Zeppelin versus Soundgarden. You can totally hear Zeppelin in Soundgarden. Totally. But but still, I see what you're saying. But it, it's like grunge th- it's that yeah. Seattle grunge and it's just something about it and yeah. we we definitely we just the the ones that we kept going back to just kind of had that thing mm-hmm. so why fight it and let's yeah. let's work on it tell you what if you're a Soundgarden fan as am I you would I would imagine especially as a drummer that you would be a Matt Cameron fan that guy is one of my all-time favorite drummers we tried to do Rusty Cage oh yeah that song I had no idea that song was so fucking hard <laughs> it is 
It's not like the fills are, are nuts no. or anything, but if, if you go off the track just a little bit, it's you basically have to start the song over. Yeah. One of the greatest things about Matt's playing, of which there are many, is his ability to make odd time signatures totally groove. Right. I think he's been, as far as a rock drummer, mm-hmm. I honestly don't know that I've ever heard somebody play it better than him. The only other guy that. that I could think of, it doesn't even play in the same genre, but it was uh, the, uh, the drummer for Mudvayne, Matt. Okay. He... He's one of those guys, too, that I, I went back and listened to LD50 because it's like 19 years old. Right. Uh, recently. I don't know if it was today or not. <laughs> yeah. But I listened to it again, and I was like, oh, my God, a lot of these songs are in really fucked up time signatures. Uh-huh. But you didn't know it because you're just following the melody of a riff or right. following the melody of a drum beat. Sure. Now, he would turn things upside down, you know, mm-hmm. just because he could. but. Mm-hmm. It was really easily digestible. Yeah, and so th- I tried to like take that mentality and apply it to Soundgarden. He's, he's much, man. He's he's so good. His live stuff, watching him perform these songs live, I'm like, okay, so you can dance. Yeah. this dude can do whatever he wants on the yeah. kit, and it is so much fun to watch. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot to learn too. He never, he hardly ever repeats himself. Yeah, maybe never. It's just every time he does something new, I'm just like, did, you, did anyone else hear that? That was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hell yeah, man! Mm-hmm. Well, early on, dude, uh, what was what were you getting into when you first started playing? And uh, did you how did you find the drum set in the first place? So my dad he he played guitar, so right. music was so kind music of in was my in the house, family, music in the family, yeah, potentially in the DNA. A little bit, yeah. yeah. My uncle did some percussion stuff with. He, he was friends with Butch Vig, oh, so nice. he used to go hang out at Smart Studios before that was knocked down in Madison, Wisconsin, where wow, I'm from. Okay. So. The rhythm thing kind of came from my dad's side. He played mm-hmm. guitar, and uh, they forced me to take piano lessons until I was done with el- elementary school. So I picked up the drums in sixth grade yep. because I heard this song, Eyeless by Slipknot. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that is the coolest intro to a song I've ever heard in my life. At that time, <laughs> you know, it's, you're 12, you're just, puberty is just starting to knock on your door. You just right. you don't know what to do with everything. And there's yes. just feelings flying everywhere, and here comes Joey Jordanson. And I was like, uh, that was fucking cool yeah can you do that again Mm -hmm. and that was it and off i went learning all the slipknot all the mud vein system of a down and i got into like seven dust lamb of god Mm -hmm. and it just uh, like heavy drumming that's really where i i came from totally like like early 2000s i guess right yeah that's late 90s maybe but probably more early 2000s early 2000s yeah early 2000s and just all that footwork, and I really, Morgan Rose is probably the guy that I would model most of my stuff off of mm-hmm. because he's so, he keeps that groove, but he adds his own little melodies, mm-hmm. you know, while dancing along with the riffs, and he doesn't get in the way of the vocals. And I just, yeah. it's listening, I still listen to his stuff and study it and just go, how the hell did you come up with that? Mm-hmm. You know, it's because it's, it's totally obnoxious as far as most pop formulas would go to play a song, but it works so well within right. seven dust you know it not to the point where it's like a metal drummer where you're like all right i got it you can do a blast beat mm-hmm. I, I, I understand where's, yeah. the, where's the groove man yeah. morgan is just he's a freak yeah you know, he's an alien freak so. yeah <laughs> what, was your, what was your first drum set uh i had a pearl export okay yeah uh bought it off of a well, well my dad bought it off of one of his friends he okay. was also a drummer and he just had you know a garage full of them and i was like well those are you know black that's rock and roll bring them <laughs> yeah, in yeah exactly man, you know um i beat the hell out of those things and in the then, house obviously oh yeah shaking pictures off the wall you yeah. name it and all that double kick pedal stuff trying to figure out how to do, do you it. have siblings uh yeah yeah i'm three of four three of four three of four yeah okay uh they hated it i bet they it did, so did none loud. of them played instruments just you um my sister older sister katie she played piano and sang okay and my younger sister elaine uh she also dabbled in piano uh, and everyone just kind of played a little bit of yeah. everything. But certainly not rattling shit off the walls with a drum set in the house. Oh, no. Everyone wanted to kill me. I yeah. bet. Oh, yeah. At every day after school, I would come home and I'd play for like an hour and a half. That's I just, absolutely. I loved it. That was the regimen. That's yeah, what you did. I, I loved it. So. Yeah. It was amazing. I <laughs> yeah. remember when I found that outlet, I was like, all right, there's no turning back. Mm-hmm. This is going to be part of my life. Yep. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. here we are, some odd, 30 some odd years later, still doing it. <laughs> it's insane. Uh, so it sounds like you got that kit, you're playing in the house, you're digging all of these drummers that you mentioned. Uh, what were some of your first bands? Oh, man, what was the rock band? We called ourselves Drive for a while, mm-hmm. and then we started calling ourselves Fragile Utopia. Fragile Utopia. Yeah, which is so fucking lame. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, they generally aren't amazing names with the first band, nor yeah. is the music. But it was it was F U for short, so we loved it and the crowd would scream it back at us and gotcha. you know, it, was, it was it was fun, you know. That's all it really mattered to us at that yeah. time. So we just we rolled with it and it was all those, you know, influence and, and stuff that we just talked about. It was a lot of groove rock stuff, mm-hmm. you know, drop C tunings and stuff. I came up with most of the riffs and played yeah. the guitar and the albums and stuff like that. Did you play guitar prior to getting your first drum set? No. Okay. But just no, once you got I, it, then you started picking up guitar? It was, I went and I saw Sully from Godsmack, and I had no idea he played guitar. And I was like, what? Uh, I knew he sang. I didn't know he played guitar. And then he sat down behind the drum kit, and yeah. I was like, Ick, what? what? Yeah. Excuse me, man? I what just is going you on Shannon right Larkin now? of Godsmack. I actually, I listened to that. Yeah. yeah it's, he's a, it's a hell of a drummer. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, listening to him explain how he learned how to play, because he plays so, so... fucked up arm. Yeah. It was makes like, sense. Okay, yeah, yeah, broken arm. That that's why no one else can do it. Like He's the can. craziest <laughs> showman. Like I mean, he was the guy that really I think started so much of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Jeez. and thin as a rail. Guy weighs about a, a, eight pounds, soaking wet with gravel in his pockets, and, and he's he, still doing it. And, and he he's harder. partially deaf. <laughs> yeah, sixty yeah. and fifty percent, but mm-hmm. either ear. I've yeah. been wearing earplugs. I, I played drums for a month without earplugs, and that's all I need. I've got tinnitus too. It's just constant ringing. There's I've nothing worn, I can do I've about always it. worn them, and I still have it. Yeah. Uh, and I talked to Shannon about it and I think he mentioned something or a doctor mentioned something to him and it makes total sense. I hadn't thought about it prior to this, which is silly, but I think the proximity of snare drum and cymbals and mm-hmm. everything and you being that close to it, regardless of what you're wearing, uh, wearing in your ears or how you think you're protecting them, that's, it's like guns going off forever, how, however many years. So yeah. it's kind of inevitable, even when wearing hearing protection and he didn't, so he's he got he fucked his ears up bad. Yeah, he's saying he has uh, hearing aids at like yeah. thirty two or something. Yes. He had to start wearing them. That bad. That's like that is outrageous. Yeah. That is so bad. Yeah. But no that's nice. good that you're wearing earplugs. I mean, that the, the earplugs have gotten so much better. I've used the ones with the filters in them. That the custom made ones, I have those. But and if I don't have that, I'll just stick bullshit. I stick anything in my ear. But I I'm, used to do. Uh, I'd go to uh, concerts and I'd grab toilet paper and wet it down. Exactly. It up just and it'd stick it in my ear. Stick it in uh, your I ear. I didn't care, man. Yeah. You know? uh, honestly, if I put it in earplugs, I can hear things better. And also, yeah. it filters out like the highs on the cymbals and stuff like no, that, absolutely. or, or the, the hair, as I like to call it, from the distortion on guitars. Yeah. And all of a sudden, everything's cleaner. So I almost prefer it now, which thank, I agree. thank God. Yeah. It takes a while to get used to, but for yeah. any drummers out there listening, do it. Okay? Put, get put a, used put a to wet it. ass napkin in your ear and stop your whining because you're going to want your hearing. <laughs> it comes in handy later. <laughs> more more <laughs> all the story. Yeah. How long were you in Wisconsin prior to moving to Austin? I, I moved at 25. It okay. Was like a quarter life crisis. Because gotcha. that country band that I was in, I found myself playing a loop uh-huh. to the same people at the same bars. So I took off from that, joined another band that was kind of like a southern rock thing, a little more rock to it. And yeah. I was playing that same loop to right. the same people. And Groundhog's like, Day. It's like, all right, that's it. Uh, my sister, my older sister Katie, had moved down there and she's like, we got a room. And I was like, I've got a room. And I just packed up my shit and I oh, left. Oh, that worked out nicely. Yeah, that was it. And it was like, find a job. I was like, okay, find a band. I, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, and just I just made it work. When you first got there, what was your impression of Austin? I was freaked out. I Were went, you? I went. D- Were like, you from a pretty small town in, in Wisconsin? Wisconsin, uh, Madison's like 250,000. Okay. So Austin is, you know, four times the size of that. Right. So it's it's huge. Yeah. And in, in my eyes, it's still a very big yeah. city. Not one of the biggest in the U.S., but sure. it's a big city. Definitely. Um. But I went like a block and a half from my house, and I heard some of the best music I had ever heard in my life. Yeah. Everyone there is, I mean, they're top notch. It is scary how good some of these musicians are. And it's, I mean, you could f- throw a rock and hit the next somebody. Definitely. You know, everyone can wail. Everyone can sing. Four and five part harmonies, that's just a Tuesday night in Austin. I mean, yeah. it's, there's some badasses in that city. For so sure. It was really intimidating. So I just knew, I was like, all right, well, I'm not the best out there. I'm self-taught. Yeah. I don't have these chops that these guys have who are going to UT and learning from top-notch professors. Right. I just need to make sure that I can do what I can do mm-hmm. better than anybody else, which sure. is hit really hard, obnoxiously, persistently, and that's it. So yeah. I, just, I just worked on hitting the snare and the toms equally and playing to a click. That was it. Yeah. And I found myself... Timing and dynamics. That was it, because what gets you... The gig is the ACDC beat. That's it. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? That's it. Man, so. Phil Rudd fucked it up for everybody. It's amazing because there was like so, all the all this fusion stuff and 
you know, that, that would, I think affected some of like the, some of the prog stuff that you would mm-hmm. hear. And then along comes ACDC, Phil Rudd does that. And then everyone's well, like, well, that's how you got to play. And yeah. I fully respect it. I absolutely 1000% love ACDC and have full respect for They're Phil amazing. Rudd. But it was an amazing, the effect that his playing, I think, had going forward with rock. Once people heard that, the simplicity of it and the pocket of it, it was like, that's what you do. There's like something primal to it. Yeah, uh, the, and the same thing happened. I, th- in my mind, at the very least, I think when I heard Joey for the first time, there was a primal aspect to his playing. Mm-hmm. Everyone has their own, you know, rhythm, if you will. It, some people say it's you know your heartbeat or whatever. If you want right. to get cheesy, but everyone has a sense of rhythm, and they do. And when they hear someone that is just like different and primal and just in tune mm-hmm. with what's going on, and it's very organic, it's it's addicting and you want to hear it again. And Joey started something different. I just started to hear drums being played different on mainstream mm-hmm. uh, rock and stuff like that. It's soon Joey as Joey Jordan, you're talking about? Yeah, 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 Slipknot. I don't know if you've ever tried to play along to an album with him, but it's, mm. you just try to keep up. I know it's, it's shredding for it's sure. It's nuts. Yeah. And, but, and with ACDC, it's just pocket playing. You yep. just sit down and it's primal and there's mm-hmm. something about it that's addicting and you just want to hear it over and over and over again. Yep. So. As it's my cool, producer man. friend calls it, the boof boff, the boof baff or whatever, however he says it, boof baff. Yeah, boom thunk is yeah. what I call it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Everybody's got a phrase for it. Yep. Wow, man. So you sh- you show up in Austin. Like you said, the level of musicianship pretty high there. So it, it's definitely a destination for so many people and so many musicians. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's still some industry there. Uh, I, th- I think like Austin and Nashville and, you know, I think New York and L.A., uh, they're, they're pretty big, like, you know, yeah. big scenes. Uh, but Austin in particular is a total rock town. That's what I, I, that's my impression of it. In w- when I've been there, I mean, I, I I would argue a little differently now. Okay, yeah, um, like folk, uh, for ind- sure, indie rock, you know, for sure, in the Texas country thing, for yeah. sure. But I was dumbfounded when I couldn't find a rock station that wasn't like Boston or or Kansas or, or wow. Journey or something like that. I would, yeah, so. There is little pockets here and there that are starting to come back, but mm-hmm. it definitely it went away for a little bit. There's like a do, there's a doom scene there totally. now. Stoner rock is coming on hard. Totally. And yes, of course, there's like your extreme metal fests and right. stuff like that too. But it's it's that was in the past year that I started to f- see those things start to like pop up. So. It's well, coming back, but it's, I don't know, it's not like the rock thing. It's. I tell you what, man, I don't know if you've had it before. I t- spoke about it with a, on one of my other interviews on this podcast, but have you had the frozen avocado margarita before in Austin? Yes. It's fucking awesome. It's awesome. It is so good, <laughs> dude. <laughs> oh, my God. We, we go to this place called uh, Baby Acapulco's across okay. from a venue uh, that our tour manager owns. It's called Come and Take It Live. But they've got this purple margarita. They limit you to two, and it's made with, like, Everclear. And you have one, and you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Halfway through that second one, you're like, oh, no, man, my lips are numb. Uh-oh. <laughs> it sneaks up on you. Yeah. Now that's a margarita. Yeah. <laughs> Austin's got some good stuff happening, man. Yep. I always love going down there. Well, you mentioned earlier that you were able to get away from your job and do, like, that first initial tour that you did with Crowbot. Had mm-hmm. you toured really prior to that outside of doing, like, the, the, the circuits with the cover bands necessarily? or mm, Not like a tour tour. Not, gotcha. not like going out for a month at a time. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. a whole that is a whole nother thing yeah just to get in the groove of that i've mm-hmm. always kind of struggled with it and i've said it before because i i like to party and uh yeah. sometimes <laughs> i can bite you in the ass and it becomes this vicious cycle of being drunk and hung over for days on end you do have and, to figure it out and maybe not playing as well as you should at yeah. least that was my experience mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and i'm still figuring that out that, that will yeah. be a lifelong battle because yeah. one is the start of 10 sometimes you know yes, and it exactly. all depends on where you are i'm sure tonight's going to be a, a shit show we got a bunch of industry people coming out and yeah. it's it's a party we're releasing the album so yep. tomorrow's going to be a little rough but you know that's part of it yeah it, it, it is cool what you're doing it is exciting so be sure to smell the roses every once in a while <laughs> but it is a job and yeah you figure it out as you go it's different for everyone so. absolutely when uh when with balance and job and going out on tour have you still obviously if you're still doing this you're able to balance that out but that can always be a really uh, a tough spot for so many people and balancing that out so have you been able to do that 
because of like Uber and Lyft or Instacart or walking dogs or anything. Anything. Yes. Yeah. So, but that's you know, the flexibility that would allow you then to yeah, do that. Yeah, the, the gig economy, I like to call it. It, yep. it works. You make your own schedule. You don't have to, nice. you know, bounce in and out. Uh, I also work at uh, the door at a place called the Saxon Pub, which okay. and, and they employed like every other musician in that city too. So nice. they get it. They've got a revolving door of people. Exactly. They're like, all right, yeah, you're going on tour, whatever. When are you back? So yeah. you you got to find your little pockets that are okay with that. Nice. But the balance, yeah, it's it's there. A rock and roll renaissance man, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, dude. Well, shit, Dan, it was good talking to you, man. Uh, congrats on Mother Brain. Thank you. Uh, psyched for the show tonight. Glad you're back, coming back through New York. For those of you listening to this, we've been sitting up on this rooftop, and there's some ominous black clouds rolling in over the Manhattan cityscape here. But uh, Storms it's, coming. It's nice and dry above us. No rain. I can no. feel it in the air tonight. There Phil Collins might have said that at I'll one point. I'll have to bust out that Phil tonight. Right. Do, 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 do. Da, do, go back, do, go. <laughs> cool, man. Good talking to you. Good luck on the rest of the tour, man. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks, as always, for dropping in, and thanks, Dan, for catching up. Thanks to St. Vitus Bar for kicking ass and always throwing some badass shows. Be on the lookout for Crowbot coming up through that little town of yours on their new record, Mother Brain, which is out everywhere. Get up on it. We'll catch you on the flippy floppy. Crash bang boom! <laughs>